All right, welcome to the State of Human Design, September 30th, 2023. Yay! Yeah, wow. Has human design news just been speeding up? Has the world been speeding up? Yeah. Seems like everything's happening all at once. Yeah, more really going on. More events per day. More just so many um, new products, services, events. Chaitanya FX just uh, created a Facebook group called Human Design Gatherings just to keep track of all the gatherings wow. going on. There's now a Denver gathering. There yeah. are the Houston gathering Casey Daly's putting on is now huge. Cool. Um, yeah, it's really it's really incredible. Houston, interesting. Right. Um, you know, Monique, uh, Moniste uh, Gagar, she's her Human Design Wisconsin has grown to 150 people and two years and then I'm pretty sure the Human Design Houston has already grown to over a hundred people in just two months. Wow. So we're seeing this great what acceleration. Yeah, it really is. So this is an actual state of human design today because we actually have updates about the culture. <laughs> I guess so. Um, but you know, as always, um, I would, I would caution, I have gate 12. So obviously the voice of caution, I would caution people to just remain true to the diligent study of human design and not give in to mere curiosity. Obviously, curiosity can be a, an impetus to study, but as the great Mistress Claire said, the knowledge is lost when the devout are overrun by the merely curious. Mm, so, wow, how about that? being a devoted student um, just simply means continuing to study, continuing to learn, continuing to research, and not just making assumptions or allowing the curiosity to then say, How could this help me? get what I want. How can this help my mind stay in control of my life? You know, yeah, that, that's what it, that's it, always a risk. There's a, that great quote from Osho that the ego that says it's dropping the ego is the subtlest form of ego of, of all. The mind that says it has no mind is the subtlest mind and so on. That's quite common in many mm -hmm. circles. And the other side of it too, that, uh, you know, people that are really enthusiastic about their curiosity, their whole thing is always like, HD needs to mutate, um, you know, we don't want to be too dogmatic or whatever. You know, that's kind of the other side of the... Right, I mean, and, and I do agree, it's just what's needed is for people to find their roles. And I say this as a base two, so obviously a very role person, your base one, you might have a, a different need that you perceive. But for me, it's, it's kind of, yes, human design needs to expand. It also needs to narrow down. Mm -hmm. It's both directions at once. Yes, it needs to adapt and evolve. It also needs to preserve the unchanging truth. Mm -hmm. So there are both directions at once. And I guess what it's saying is as it reaches more people, sure, that's a need. It will need to change its language to reach more people for those people. But it also needs to do so in a way that does not hamper and hinder the ability of the original human design teaching from mm -hmm. continuing on mm -hmm. because that also needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. So there's this great quote from J.S. Mill. He said, in an argument, each party tends to be correct in what they affirm and wrong in what they deny. Cool. By which, if you say, human design has harmful presuppositions in it, we should change the language. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. You can adapt the language to reach a different audience. You're wrong that it has harmful presuppositions right. because it's wrong in what is denying. Or mm -hmm. I heard um, you know, a talk at the conference saying that, that much of the languaging of human design needs to change because it can be so damaging to people. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Mm -hmm. It does not need to change. It's not damaging to mm -hmm. people. It's empowering and it's helping people. It is true that you can adapt that language to reach a different audience mm -hmm who I don't think they would be damaged per se by the old language, mm -hmm. but would at least not get it, mm -hmm. not understand it. They might misunderstand it in a right. way where their own misunderstanding is damaging. You can make the language available so that people are less likely to damage themselves through misunderstanding. A, a different group, right? Yeah, yeah new groups that, that may already have damaging beliefs and preconceived right, notions right. that they are bringing with them mm -hmm. and that these damaging assumptions and beliefs are then being, you know, um, misapplied using and misconstrued with with right so you know I, I i would just say that yes as human design evolves and grows and changes there will be new language that will reach a new audience that audience will be farther down the fractal line mm. and there's this great irony where you know as it helps people it eventually the the cure turns into the poison and so mm. there will have to be a point where we have to call it and where human design will no longer be helpful Mm. And that's going to be 
perhaps a hundred years from now, who knows? But right now it's so mutative and it's so fresh and it's so helpful and it's empowering people and it's helping them take the next step. Once they've taken that step, it may no longer be useful mm -hmm. or they may have internalized it such that they no longer need to debate whether it's useful or not. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's these, these kind of movements of information that all originate with an individual and that's the source of all creativity. And in our case, that individual is raw. Mm -hmm. And then as people who don't get raw still want to access that information, there are levels and levels and layout, and you have one degree from raw and two degrees. Pretty soon you're 200 degrees. Pretty soon you're 2,000 degrees mm -hmm. of separation. Mm -hmm. And that can still be useful. I mean, eventually it loses its use, right? Eventually it's not useful at all. Mm -hmm. Eventually it's simply um, turns into the same, you know, homogenized message that you can get from anything. Mm -hmm. All is for the greater good, or, I mean, and even these messages that could be very profound if we were to understand them deeply, but they've lost the ability for us to access them in a profound way. Mm -hmm. uh, as Jung put it, Nietzsche was wrong, God is not dead. We have simply lost our symbols for him, our mm -hmm. way of accessing that numinous. And so it's not even that the human design message becomes invalid as much as it becomes ineffective at a certain level of fractal, down the fractal line. Mm -hmm. People just say it as a truism and they don't actually understand it right. in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, which is all to say we're at a wonderful time where human design is expanding, it is growing. It, we also need to narrow down and, and protect the knowledge so that there just aren't simple mistakes like um, people saying that, you know, describing logical circuitry as if it were abstract and so on, which by the way is something that logical people always try to describe their circuitry and kind of steal what abstract does hmm. and vice versa. Just as one example, that there's so many biases that if we really want to discuss the differences between circuitries or the differences between types, it's not enough for one circuitry to describe that difference. Right. Yeah. Any true. more than it's different than it's possible for one gender to describe gender mm -hmm. difference, right? Yeah. It's like there's different differences. There's different mm -hmm. ways of constituting that difference. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the preservation of the human design knowledge is to not allow the biases and prejudices to creep in of one particular design. People even accuse Ra of his prejudices creeping in. Well, how could he know about projectors? He was a manifester and so mm -hmm. on. And that's not a valid critique. In fact, that's a fetter that has to be overcome. The mm -hmm. belief that someone of a different type couldn't understand your type yeah. or someone of a different... No, I mean, these are universal things. I love... Well, I think the more yeah. reasonable version of that is just that acknowledging that Ra is a filter, as we all are, or whatever. Absolutely. It's not that, it's not that he's going to be wrong about any of his takes or whatever, but just understand that that filter is always in place, regardless of what We are like. all filters, but that filtration does not invalidate the absolute right. or the need for dogma. Right. There's a real anti-dogmatism of the not-self that wants to turn everything into relativistic right. mush. And meanwhile, it holds on tightly to the dogmatic interpretation of the news mm -hmm. as good or bad. Right. And so human design reverses that. Anytime you get news, you can no longer say unequivocally that was good or bad. You right. can't say it was tragic. You mm -hmm. can't say it's celebration and so on. You have to kind of wait and see, wait right. and see, wait and see. But meanwhile, um, you allow for a strict dogmatism of your inner authority is an right. inalienable right yeah, yeah. of your life form. And that's will the always, yeah. exactly yeah. and that will always guide you correctly no matter what yeah because so. if because if you listen to raw and then don't know that the filter is there then that's more likely to become dogma too because you think that someone is being totally absolute you know as close to absolute as he gets it's like you um you like without the filter it's like not having the meta text you know everything that we hear from raw is assisted by what we know about him Right, right. But the real purpose of learning more about Ra is not to try to find where he made a mistake because he was a manifester or because he was a 5-1 or right. he didn't understand projectors or he didn't understand right variable or any of this. That is the wrong assumption. The reason to learn more about Ra and to learn about that filter is to understand what he really meant mm -hmm. by his keynotes so that we can right. deconstruct them and to extract the original meaning from them. Right. The, the essence of those keynotes that he put in there. So, it, it, you know, there's just a lot of um, curiosity about human design that's only curious insofar as it validates some preconceived notion and that they only want to learn about Ra insofar as 
they can find a way that he was wrong about something because of his perspective. We don't learn somebody's unique perspective to invalidate what they say. We learn their unique perspective to better understand them. Totally, yeah. And there's a real lack of understanding and an uncharitable approach in, in a lot of human design, um, second wave, third wave, fourth wave, and so on, just because of the lack of understanding uh, of what, what he actually meant. Right. So, if, but, if he's yeah. really the messenger, then the message isn't just the transcripts of everything he says. It's also all this other thing, these things about details about his presentation and about his life and whatever. And so it's like the more you get a gestalt of who this filter is, like the more you can understand the literal language that he's using in these transcripts. Right, right. People get hung up on the language. They get hung up on the pointing, not looking at what's pointed at. Mm -hmm. So, so but yeah, we're in an exciting time, and I wanted to thank... KC Daily for pointing this out. It was um, in August, I guess. It was August 22nd, 21st, somewhere in there. So just about six weeks ago, five weeks ago, that we reached the exact midpoint of the final seven-year cycle up to the changing of the keys. Wow. So thank you for pointing that out, Casey. And it, we are now within the three and a half year time up to 2027, mm. which is just incredible, right? It's now 2023, but we're now six months after you know february 15th so yeah I, I guess or even a little i guess i thought it was august 21st it could be because of leap years and things like that it, it, or it could have been a little bit earlier but either way in mid-august we reached um this incredible tipping point mm -hmm. you know there are a lot of tipping points but in the final seven year cycle lead up to 2027 that tipping point uh well we're in the final stretch so we're feeling it. We're seeing it. All this, um, all the like 2027 stuff, it becomes truer every day. All these signs of the world to come. Yeah, I never go on uh, well, what is now called X, um, Twitter, but I went on there just to read your, your Twitter because it's so good. Mm -hmm. And I saw that, I guess, that you were telling me that now everybody just has like an FYP this For You page that just kind of shows you stuff that you're not oh, yeah, subscribed right. to. So I saw Elon Musk, mm -hmm. and all he's been tweeting about is the fall of the Roman Empire <laughs> and that we're accelerating towards a new dark age, and he's just showing photos of his collection of books on the fall of the Roman Empire and culture collapse. Funny. I mean, it's all like... Uh, he was probably yeah. inspired by that meme a couple weeks ago that was, um, how often do men think about the Roman Empire? Be, and people take these videos of them like asking their boyfriends how often you think about the Roman Empire and were surprised when they said every day <laughs> <laughs> probably every day <laughs> but, and, yeah I mean but maybe that's why he's on this kick it was kind of a big be. meme there for um, could be well you know Philip K. Dick had his own interesting theory which is that time stopped oh, the yeah. time of the Roman Empire and that everything since then is this that we're actually in is it Black Iron Prison is what yeah. we called it. And the, the Black Iron Prison, it's almost like this matrix theory that it, we're all slaves in the Roman Empire, but that everything is kind of existing within this bubble. Right, and it's just being rephrased. I mean, that is when the lock was, and all these key periods in the global cycles are not unlocking the lock to come, they're unlocking that lock. Well, I mean, the Roman Empire wasn't the cross of planning, though. No, 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 the lock. The last time we had a, um, was it a Sphinx or a Vessel of Love? Oh, I see what you're saying. So the last time so that the keys and the locks lined up. Right. That's We're, so interesting. Well, yeah, because, you know, every, like, seven years or whatever, it's instead of having all the keys, you have all the locks. And the last time we had all the locks. Every seven was, cycles, you mean, or every... Every, what are they called? Ages, cycles? Yeah, across the planning cycles. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, they're 410 year cycles. Those, yeah, so those periods, every seven of those, right. it's either a Sphinx or a Vessel. So the last time we That's had right. one of these G Center ones was the Roman Empire. So and that, that kind of locked us into that. Yes, and all these, and all these cycles that we call keys, like the keys of, of the time now, or, you know, gate nine or gate 16 or whatever yeah, it is, all exactly. these. Those are not the keys to the next lock, they're the keys to the Roman Empire lock. Right, that makes sense. That is really, really interesting. You that's how we right. That's how we access. That's a really interesting way of looking at that. I, I had seen that the, you know, the locks, of course, are the Sphinx and the Love Gates. It and must I, have been I, Vessel of Love, duh, because it was Christ. Christ was around that. It's like this whole <laughs> yeah. message of love thing. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's a, and I've, I've seen that the keys sometimes are, and that's so interesting that that kind of sets the tone. That sets the timbre for the uh, that age, like the larger age. Yeah, <laughs> like a couple the, thousand the round years. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the round is more like eighteen thousand yeah. years. But 
in any case, that's, uh, yeah, so we're now 3.5 years to the changing of the keys. And uh, wow, things are just accelerating so much. Um, seeing just this explosion of human design, this is of course the year that USA Today said astrology is out and human design is right. in. They so, call that. <laughs> USA yeah. Today, they got their was, It wasn't the Wall Street Journal? They probably made something too. I uh, know that USA Today made uh, that famous N out list. Uh, yeah, I thought and that was that, Wall Street Journal. That's, yeah, so. Same difference, right? Yeah. Isn't it really? Yeah. <laughs> Same difference. Hmm. Well, um, things have been moving quickly for, I guess, both of us as well. Um, in July, I finally left my job of nine years, and then I, thank you, and I started teaching and had a really wonderful lines class. I know you were a guest of that class for three day, um, three sessions. And we got great feedback from that, and I was told by numerous students that it was their favorite sessions. People also oh. loved uh, James Alexander, who was the guest speaker. But of the sessions I did, our co-host ones were the favorites. Real, nice. real crowd pleaser. We have a good dynamic. And so, um, I don't know how much we want to announce now, but just in the works. TBD in the works. My uh, class? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, you'll be teaching it, but I will be there helping out in any way I can and just kind of being a TA and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, very, very excited. Um, Want to, should we announce the topic? Is it the topic? Individual circuitry and melancholy? Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a really strong start. You know, I was trying to think of what I would have my first class be, and the lines was just something that I've been thinking a lot about lately. But starting with individual circuitry is kind of starting at this, this root, yeah, this mutative root of just, you know, what it is to, to be alive. And, and regardless of if anyone has that circuitry or not, we all know what you know what it is to be alone in the world and to have our individual role and to experience ourselves and we're all empowered by human design and so starting with empowering is really important i think yeah and it's just something that i have a lot of practical advice for and can put together a really practical curriculum about because mm -hmm. yeah individuals you know by necessity kind of misunderstood because it's always different it's perpetually different Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So yeah, but the Lions class was a huge success. We had such a blast. Thanks to all the Lions students, really great students. Thank you, Mike, for being a guest for that. And then I'm excited for your uh, individuality and melancholy class. Yeah. Um, you know, I get to be the TA is kind of my my excuse to get to attend. So cool. <laughs> or you know, you, you can tell me what you actually. You can know, audit it if you want. <laughs> thank you. I will be auditing uh, <laughs> in your class. So. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about that. Um, and yeah, it's been um, just a lot of changes for, for both of us. I mean, um, a lot of successes. I know we just had the offside police party last night. For those who don't know, Mike has this incredible newspaper with his partner, Diana, and um, they do a really, really great job on this. Thank you. And uh, it's just really... I think you skipped right past the big news, though. What were you, the big news? <laughs> what were you doing in the month of September? Well, I mean, there was big. There were big August and big September for me. August, I was at Burning Man. That's right. that's the biggest news. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Human design. But for, from, yeah, from oh yeah, that is that is important. Yeah, because you said that you, the last time you were at Burning Man, you felt like you were bringing human design there, right? Because there's like no representation of it. Yeah, and this time there was actually another teacher nice. who had not even planned to going to to go to Burning Man. She had been on a tour with an artist of all these festivals, and then a week before Burning Man got tickets and decided to go, mm. and just thought, well, to contribute, why not teach about human design? Mm. So she only taught one class, but I, I attended it, and um, yeah, it was. She kind of introduced a, a you know, bunch of people to type strategy and authority. It was, it was cool. nice to see. Nice. And then meanwhile, uh, Richard Corbett did an incredible intro class. He had about 25 people and then they, most of them got readings afterwards. And it was quite the buzz. I mean, there was a lot of buzz. And then I, I personally would walk around with a sign that said human design readings mm. that Von Paul made. He kind of threw me a sign and I would walk around and I couldn't make it one block without people stopping me for wow. So I, I, I gave about 40 readings. Whoa, there. cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, which is about the number I did the previous year also. Mm. So, um, but yeah, human design at, at Burning Man. I ran into a few, well, I ran into one good human design friend, uh, Victoria. It was so nice seeing, oh, cool. seeing her there. Oh, nice. And um, I know that there were a couple other 
folks there that I hadn't realized they were there until after, because it's just kind of so chaotic. But mm -hmm. definitely want to go back and bring more human design to Burning Man. I think it's a really good fit because people are open to transformational experiences. And also, it's just what's interesting to me. I reflected a lot on the global cycles and the end of experiential diversity mm -hmm. and how we're still in this heyday of just maximalist experiential diversity where we can experience almost anything. It's like, what experience do you want from the saccharine to the devilish, from the adventurous to the tame? I mean, mm -hmm. there's just such mm -hmm. a, I mean, there's everything from like reading groups to skydiving. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's really um, all sorts of stuff there. And so having that experiential diversity is kind of like, the program is saying, what experiences do you want for your bucket list right. before they all go away? Yeah, good point. Like, that is what it is. You, you yeah. had actually told me, I didn't see this, right, but about this this plane there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they would take people around who, oh, yeah. who had never had uh, any sort of intimate encounter in the so-called Mile High Club. Hot, hot air balloons, too, I think. Were, were they doing that in the hot air balloons? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I certainly saw the hot air balloons. <laughs> they didn't know what they were doing. Up there, <laughs> but, uh, okay, well, <laughs> turns out that the human experiential way is just like, Something plus sex. Yeah. That's basically it. Pancakes <laughs> and sex. Yeah. You know. Um, so anyway, but uh, no, there were also some very. Um, I mean, it's it's really everything from from the debauched all the way to the um, studious and kind of more just people who are just wanting to learn and share knowledge and teach. And mm -hmm. obviously, uh, there was no human design and sex. That's um, they don't really fit that well. Although I, I did hear in the human design and sexuality talk at HDHD mm. that projectors will sometimes use sex as a way to try to guide people. And, and it uh, never works. Yeah. It never works. They're like, yeah. this is how I'm going to get you, and then yeah. I can guide you. And then, no, you kind of got to start with recognition. You can't. I would actually say if people are looking at projectors, particularly if generators are just seeing sexuality from the projector, they're probably not really recognizing them. Right. Because the recognition is of the outer authority and the nine centered communion and the life force energy. And guess what? There's no, you know, but guess what? 35, 36 is not, not a projector channel, right? Yeah. And neither is 659. Mm -hmm. And so, so anyway, these, these kind of channels of sexuality, I guess there are still some channels of sexuality, 1949, 3955 and so on. So I, I won't say that if you're not seeing, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule that if you're seeing a projector as a sex symbol, I mean, Prince was a sex symbol. Right, right. Because that's like a form of recognizing their like flavor, their aesthetic. Especially whatever. if it's an actual solar plexus channel. Right. Yeah. But yeah. if it's not, then then you know it's probably yeah. just seeing them as um, seeing them as they're not self sacral or something. Right, either. right. As somebody that can be uh, used, you know, but not necessarily not not actually recognized. So. But anyway, I had a great time at Burning Man. I really want to take you next year or in the future. So you should definitely come with me. That's my should for the day. I only get one should a day. But, uh, <laughs> Yahoo! <laughs> yeah, that's my should. So, but you were saying the big news was September. Uh, What's that big news? The conference? Oh, yeah. Well, I figure <laughs> everyone knows about that. Is that even, that's, that's like so big. It's kind of, but what happened at the conference? That's the real Everyone question. wants to know. <laughs> yeah, everyone wants to know. What happened at the conference? Well, uh, the conference was amazing. I mean, this was the best year yet. Uh, best and biggest. Best and biggest, yeah. They were all good. The first year was so special and heartwarming. Last year was really transformative, and I remember just hearing just how well you used. This year was just wow. I mean, the vibe was so good. It was um, incredibly buffering against any sort of issues that would come up. So. It was like having this big buffer of, I don't want to say positivity because it wasn't just positive mental attitude, but this buffering of ability to flow fluidly through the Maya with lack of resistance, such that when resistance did come up, it just kind of was contained and moved off and there was like this self-healing mesh yeah. that just kind of self-organized around that. So that's even so when things you know, Like a wound happen, healing itself. Exactly, yeah, it was a very yeah. rapidly self-healing Thing where if something didn't work right, something didn't happen right, everything else kind of self-organized around it and people self-selected to fill different roles, to yeah. problem solve. And it was very easy. Yeah. yeah, there was just a lot of independent movement that didn't uh, interfere with, with each other. And it was pretty, pretty special. Yeah. A lot of passengers. Yeah, there you go. People trusting their, their G-Center and having clean 
trajectories that weren't being interfered with. And were you able to go to the projector only event? No. Okay, so that was raise. yeah. That sounds really cool. I heard a number of different reviews about that, but one was I mean, uh, you know, across the board, people were saying how incredible to have thirty-five projectors, nobody even the other type. So first of all, just the experiment of having that many projectors. Mm -hmm. Second, I asked Ray to describe it, and he said, well, people spoke, and people actually listened. <laughs> so that was kind of different from the normal, I guess, wow. for him. That was his way of describing it. And then uh, I think it was Monique yeah, who said that um, people weren't bumping into each other. Yeah, I'm sure. So that was interesting that there was like a situational awareness of not bumping into people. But then um, they weren't all glowing reviews. I mean, it wasn't anything bad other than just um, some people had to leave, that they just couldn't take it. Like, the projector thing? Or yeah, the yeah. No, not, not the whole conference, just the projector thing. Like, I mean, we can, <coughs> we can speculate as to why they might leave, but I think it was more just, um, just the intensity of having all these projectors <laughs> focusing on you and stuff yeah. like that. Probably also could feel really good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there could just be a certain intensity level. So I know a few people left. But um, even in that case, they were still really happy that they'd been part of that experiment and see what it was all about mm. and so on. So, yeah, I heard pretty pretty positive reviews from that. Ray definitely wants to do it again next year. And he said, and then we can have a generator-only day and a manifestor-only day and a reflector. Yeah. And I'm like, I think just the generator-only day is like every, every day. day. Yeah. <laughs> manifestor-only day, do they really, I mean... They want to have their own group, and they did, yeah. but I'm going to let them self-organize. Yeah. They don't want a projector yeah. organizing their group. Right. And then uh, the reflectors really just want to sample and go around and experiment and be a part of different communities. And yeah, if they want to have their own you know, reflector-only events, mm -hmm. there were reflector-focused events, but that was interesting. Each of the types had their events. So there were there were numerous, the most events of all were for the, were for the manifestors, actually. They had the nice. most number of events for manifestors only. Three. Hmm. Three manifesto only events. And one of those was hosted by a projector. Speaking. Right, right. And I actually, the one manifesto I talked to who went to that said it was great. So, I mean, yes. I, I think that there can be more open-mindedness in that regard. But those three events were manifesto only. There may have actually been four, now that I think of it. And they were, um, by all accounts, a huge success, although I didn't really hear so much about them other than just that they were successful. Then there were two projector only events. One was a projector only day event and then the other was the workshop. There was one generator only event and then there were no reflector only events but there was a lunar cycle mapping your lunar cycle event for reflectors, reflectors yeah. but they're so inclusive that like anyone who wanted to come yeah. could. <laughs> and so that was really interesting for me to see that the, re that the reflectors had the option to have the yeah. reflector only event but mm -hmm. it was like no no let's be inclusive like other people can get value from looking at the lunar cycle which is true <laughs> yeah. they absolutely can. Yeah. And so it was special to kind of see that, that uh, willingness to share. Um, but yeah, really, I mean, seven reflectors again this year. What a special event. What were some of your highlights? Um, nah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so much, right? We had something like 80 events. It's hard yeah, to Yeah, yeah. I liked, um, I really liked James's talk on profiles. That was some interesting stuff. The psychology of the lines yeah. and going into some of the shadows of the lines. Yeah. I like that Really so great keynotes. Much. He just nailed people's mental rationalizations for bad behavior mm -hmm. and their justifications using human design. Well, I'm a sixth line, so I'm on the roof, sorry. I'm a second line, I'm hermiting, sorry. I'm a fifth line, you're just projecting on me, sorry. It was really He had some really good so sound good. bites. Yeah, oh, gosh. and signposts, yeah. It's like every time a new slide would come up, everyone in the audience would take a picture of it. because it's like... <laughs> Yeah, that's true. The slide would come up and then you'd see everybody pull out their phones yeah. and yeah. Much to James's, uh, no, we're not sure. No, my material. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so, so good. And, you know, I, I hope that people who do value James will show that value by taking his classes and actually paying him for his, his work because he works very, very hard. I want to buy Brynion's book. That book looks really good. Both the new one and the old. I'm so excited. I have a package sent from her that I haven't opened yet. I've been doing that Kierkegaard thing where you wait three days to open mail so you just build the excitement even more. Like, oh, I, nice. I look at it every day and I'm like, ooh. What's so, it yeah. From Ceremonious, yeah. which is her uh, website and, and publishing company, ceremonious.com. And 
came in the mail and she said, hey, John, I just sent you something for your birthday. And so I'm really excited to see what it is. But oh, and her talk was a big hit, right? Yeah, well, she did a number of... Uh, like, I saw part of the interview. I didn't yeah, she did an interview. She did a talk on yin mysticism and kind of the yin version of the lines, which Rachel said was very much the second line follow-up to Ra's first line. And the cool thing uh, Rachel said was that we're now seeing kind of second generation, but also second line, mm. lived life experience and naturals True. who are emerging with knowledge as a complement to the first line knowledge from Ra, which nice. is all the theory. Now we're seeing the practice of it. We're seeing that, that emerge. And uh, yeah, I thought, I thought she had a lot of really interesting and good, good things to say. Although I also, um, you know, it, everything she said that she affirmed, I agreed with, and everything that she said was harmful or dangerous about human design, I disagreed with. Uh, I can kind of think, <laughs> think well, because it's the it's the straw man thing where the only person who actually believes those things is the one saying that somebody else believes them, right, right. but it's a displaced belief. Right. And we learned this in um, you know psychoanalysis. There's a tremendous. It's like the only one who actually believes this thing is the person saying those people believe that. Right. And True. so her idea of all these people believe these harmful things is like, actually, that is the only, it's, it's irony. I'm right. a fifth line, so right. I see irony everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the, the great irony is that the, the beliefs are displaced mm -hmm. onto these imaginary right. others who are then kind of portrayed as the, right. the, the evildoers who need to be stopped. So I don't think we need to stop anything. I mean, when she would say, for instance, it's very harmful to tell the undefined throat to wait to be spoken to first before they speak. That was actually one of the most empowering things in my life. Mm -hmm. That was such positive transformation mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. It was incredibly empowering and it's not dangerous because the danger that I might then mentally decide to not speak first. And I mean, I use my sacral to decide when to speak. Mm -hmm. I use my decision-making navigation to decide when to mm -hmm. speak. If I want to speak first, I'll speak first. If I speak second, I'll speak second. But experimenting with waiting to be spoken to first, something mm. Ra says, if you're an undefined throat, don't speak first. Mm. That's not dangerous. Mm -hmm. The only danger is mental decision-making mm. all around. Because mm -hmm. if you are making decisions according to your strategy and authority, you're not it doesn't do matter right. what anybody says because you're not going to trust what they say anyway. Right. So there's no extra danger. I mean, the danger is already there. People are already making mental decisions. Mm -hmm. They're already taking what other people say too seriously right. and they're trying to, you know, oh, Ross said I shouldn't talk first, so I'll never talk first. I'm going right. to now mentally impose this rule on myself. That's not living your design. Yeah. That's not experimenting with strategy and authority. Exactly, yeah. But his saying, you're, a, you know, you're an undefined throat, don't speak first, was hugely helpful for me. And most every example she had mm -hmm. were things that were personally helpful for me in my journey and I believe would be helpful for many others or I've witnessed being helpful for many others. And then she was saying that she was harmed by those things. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. She doesn't mm -hmm. seem harmed at all. She's brilliant, astute, you know, extremely successful. Mm -hmm. She's a generator who just builds so much and exudes mm -hmm. satisfaction. Mm -hmm. She's living her design, mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone could harm her with some <laughs> harmful opinion about what she should or shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. She didn't seem to care about anybody's, you know, I mean, like, mm -hmm. in that very healthy way. Mm -hmm. so it was a very healthy, empowered, brilliant person. And so I loved her talk, but there's, there's definitely a little... I, not just from her, but I see it as a common kind of fear that people are being hurt. I've heard this from uh, Lasita Shalev. I've heard this from, from others who say, well, you know, talking about the not self can be really harmful to people. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's not. Um, I had a great, uh, there was a great text thread with uh, Minkyu, a student at the Lions class, who was saying it wasn't until he was introduced to the not self about three, three and a half years into his human design experiment that everything radically changed. In wow. fact, he was wondering, if he started his experiment then. And after talking, I said, no, I don't think you did, but I think that three and a half year mark was the perfect time after three and a half years of experimenting mm. with strategy and authority to now learn to recognize the not self. Right. Because that recognition of the not self can also be, I guess it, it can, people can get really hung up if they do it too soon. It's right. like, when is the right time to really recognize that? Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's, harmful to talk about the not self in a reading it's also not harmful to not talk about it you could do a whole reading and never <laughs> talk about the not self and simply lean into the channel keynotes mm -hmm. lean into what resources they do have available mm -hmm. to remind people hey you have this you're really good at this mm -hmm. you can do this try your strategy and authority wait to be invited mm -hmm. wait for your emotional clarity right things like that mm -hmm. they're both valid but mm -hmm. the one saying you shouldn't do not self readings 
or the other saying, you know, you shouldn't omit the not self. Again, wrong in what they deny. Right. We tend to be right in what we affirm and wrong in what we deny. And so there's a time and a place for it. And, and part of being, a, you know, after you've gotten that first line foundational knowledge, part of the lived life experience of practicing human design is knowing when to lean into one or the other. Mm -hmm. Who is too worried and shouldn't worry? Who's not worried enough and you need to tell them about the not self mm. or things like that. Mm. Uh, but I don't see the not self as something Ra made up to scare people into giving him money or something right. like that, right? right? It's something that is the binary. We're in a binary biverse and mm. you can't just stick on one side and not go to the other. Although it is valid that it, for certain people in certain times, you don't necessarily need to, to use go there. Yeah. Exactly. But I still, I loved her talks. I went to two of her four talks that she did, and uh, her interview just had me rolling and just smiling and, you know, ear to ear. And then her Ian Mysticism talk was very thought provoking and really good keynoting. Mm. And just overall, it's just really good. So, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also had a, I was so happy she got to go to 10,000 Waves, and I got to go to, for those who don't know, um, 10,000 Waves is this spa, and we, Got some free tickets this year, and it was really nice to take some human design folks there and have conversations late into the night mm. in the saunas and hot, hot tubs. Really nice. What a nice atmosphere. It was a perfect Sunday night end of the conference. So overall, I loved the conference. I it was my favorite yet. I mean, I guess it's kind of like when you have a new piece of art or a new song, it's always your favorite, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, last year's was my favorite then, the first year's was, you know. But uh, yeah, it was pretty incredible. Yeah, I didn't really write down any of my notes from favorites, but a lot of the talks were great. Teo was great, you were great. Um, yeah, Brandy was wonderful. I loved Brandy's opening. Yeah, it was so good, the way mm -hmm. she opened and playing a rock quote, and mm -hmm. also her descriptions of human design were just, it was so nice seeing her slides and hearing her just kind of give this overview intro to human design, but doing it in a way that just made me feel really proud, mm. like proud of this system of knowledge and how it's been developed and how we're kind of carriers of this knowledge. Mm. Um, it just, it had a big impact. I mean, it really did. Um, yours was great. I mean, so, so many good, good speakers and yeah, really enjoyed every, everyone's comments and ideas and really really good i heard a lot of great things as well from talks that i missed that i'm really hoping to, to catch up on mm. so. and just meeting everyone uh, allison was totally awesome came to our generator night i loved Teresa brenneman and brandy gilmartin's evening they were so good and it was such a fun event that they hosted and just really good topics too i mean it was kind of um a sacrally defined only night hmm. and at first we were just having, having a good time but then they would actually bring up topics and the topics were really good and I mean it was we were all laughing and giggling and having a great time but it was also important stuff like they did at one point say okay let's talk about projectors and then suddenly uh -huh. all the generators are like ooh what are we gonna do we're gonna bad <laughs> we did not badmouth the projectors I, my hypo my assumption is that they badmouth us when they talk about generators we just talked about how much we adore projectors. We talked about you. Uh, they, they talked about Brayden, how much they love Brayden, and how much. I mean, we, we talked about like all the projectors in our life that we really cherish and value and love. And it was kind of like a love fest for projectors. So if, if projectors nice. want to know what generators talk about <laughs> when we're all alone together and projectors come up, it's how much we love particular projectors and what they've done for us. And yeah, it was really not at all uh, what they might imagine. You guys must be bad now, I guess, or something. And, you know, maybe it's the other way around, too. I mean, I've never been in a room full of projectors. But they probably don't even talk about generators. They're probably like, finally, we don't have to talk about generators. It's like the, the Bechdel test for, for human design, oh, right? Oh, Does the story yeah. have no mention of a generator yeah. for, uh, <laughs> right? Are there, more than, are, are there two projectors in a room and they're not talking about a generator? <laughs> that's the, uh, that's mm -hmm. the real test, right? So, because they have to talk about us so much of the time outside of their mm -hmm. own kind of spaces so but anyway um yeah it was such a such a warm and fuzzy time with all the generators it was great loved the aura experiments we had that one aura experiment that was booked across the time of the uh, projector only event so we ended up having no projectors there. Oh, funny. nine generators four reflectors one manifester it was basically pre-1781 
Ren Fair Bazaar yeah, <laughs> cosplay. So we kind of were all just flashing back to like this pre seventeen eighty one time, nice. a world without projectors. <laughs> you know what was that like? And Dark Ages. Of course, we had Singh the uh, Pharaoh yeah. Pasha. <laughs> he was uh, surrounded by his four advisors, these you know reflectors who looked straight out of Game of Thrones. And each, <laughs> you know, one had a twirly beard and one had long hair. And, you know, they they just looked like the kind of high priests and priestesses of a king's circle and yes. the uh, funniest part was you know they were in the main room and then all of us generators came and we're kind of like so we're doing aura experiments and like no nobody heard us we couldn't hear <laughs> so then we finally went on the microphone and we're like aura experiments starting in three minutes <laughs> and then we like, came back and did it again we basically just surrounded them and then they were kind of like go go jonah like they're kind of like they like pushed me to kind of try to you know interrupt them and then finally they were like yes and you know <laughs> kind of that attitude and they said so, you know, um, we were thinking, because there's nine of us and only five of you, maybe you want to go to the smaller room, and mm -hmm. we would stay here, and then we would kind of do this experiment going between the rooms. And they just looked, complete silence, mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, because there's only five of you, complete silence, mm -hmm. finally it's like, or, or <laughs> we could go in the other room, <laughs> still silence, but all the generators behind me are like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> so then we all just like scurried into the other room and uh, we would send one generator into the manifester, you know, reflector zone mm -hmm. back and forth and they would come back and kind of say how they felt. And it was really cool. I mm -hmm. loved it. So we actually got a lot of that recorded. So that's for the, for the books. But, um, yeah, that was a really, really big highlight for me, and um, just meeting so many great people. I don't really have any notes on HDHD. My note just says HDHD. That's nice. all that it says. So. Well, you freestyle plenty. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's easy to talk about because it was a very full week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Any any last thoughts on the conference? What do you want to see next year? No, we've got other news items to get to. That's true. Well, my notes are all chronological. I don't know about yours. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so chronologically, after HD at Burning Man, coming back, having the conference, there was the post-conference retreat. Oh, yeah. And I just want to say thanks for bringing such a personal and touching and just very, like, you brought the campsite chat mm -hmm. to, the, you, you took what I wrote seriously. I said this year, because previous years we'd just gone camping. Mm -hmm. This year we went camping too, but just for a short part of it. And I just said I wanted to bring the fireside chat mm -hmm. into, basically, the, the, the home, into the, into the urban environment. I brought my ghost stories. Yeah, exactly. He brought your ghost stories. I needed someone with 33 sitting next to me while I told that. <laughs> yeah. I like, can't normally tell my story. <laughs> yeah, so I well, borrowed some you were really stories. good at it. And it, both of your sessions were just so personal and so touching. And I just really appreciated just that you took it seriously to actually get mystical and um, to, be, to be vulnerable in that way. And to just, it is vulnerable talking about mysticism. It is personal. I mean, it's a very personal thing. And it was great. And I really enjoyed my sessions too. I did two days of base theory. Then we had a day off. And then we did two days of global cycles. And that was really interesting too, just to kind of, I enjoyed putting together the slides for those and just having those those talks. Mm. And then we had Richard Corbett also looking at outer planet transits, doing human design and astrology. And then the whole thing culminated in a symposium on the planets, mm. which was just so much fun. Mm. It was an all-day event where we were where we were wearing ch chitons and doing kind of ancient Greek uh, plays mm. and jokes short stories and poetry. Genoa and Lasita came to meet a bunch of us in the park, which was mm -hmm. so sweet of them, just to kind of meet the new wave of human design people. You know, you were there for that and got to briefly meet them. And it just, and then the evening was just so good. Singh stole the show, but all of the actors oh, yeah. were really good. Jen Cole was great as the nun. Um, Singh was the madman. Mm -hmm. And the madman and the nun. Brandy Jordan did a great job as the narrator. My dad, uh, John Dempsey, he was one of the doctors. What we a had, voice. We had Orion Ohab one of the doctors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we had Krista, she was the, the head nurse. And we even had Ray uh, right at the end. He was mm -hmm. Professor Baldorf. Right. So what <laughs> How a fun, Yeah, <laughs> what a fun, he was kind of like a surprise, like third act, surprise ghost. Mr. Biodynamic over here. <laughs> 
But yeah, it was really, yeah, he does do a lot of biodynamic farming. But um, yeah, it was just, what a, what a sweet time. So that whole post-conference retreat, um, really from the time we went to camp, passed. I mean, the first couple of days, we were, we were still kind of coming off the conference, so it didn't really feel like a retreat yet. It just kind of felt like post-conference without the retreat. Mm. But then, as soon as a group of us went out to camp at Sand Monk Ranch, mm. And we were just an hour outside of Santa Fe, and it was so wonderful just being out in nature and under the sky and with the fire. Mm. Uh, Richard and uh, Randy brought wood for the fire, and we're so thoughtful, and we all had snacks, and wow. just sit around the fire for hours with pinyon burning. It was so sweet. Wow. And once we came back after that, it was like, okay, we're in full-on retreat mode. Sweet. This is now its own thing, and we just had such a fun time and going thrifting, and. God, Rachel made so much amazing food. Rachel Puella, mm. every single day, was just making some of the best food I've had in my life. Home-cooked, delicious, taking into account everybody's dietary requirements. Wow. I mean, that's a world I want to live in. You mm. know? Where the servers know PHS and mm. where friends make each other food that you all... No, that was kind of a joke because... Uh, you, 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 you heard the whole story about how we ended up with... Um, At the apothecary? Yeah. Yeah, that was a great the story. Apothecary, the apothecary story. The short version is there was a server who recognized some of our conference attendees and came out at one point and said, so I know that you're trying to order according to your PHS. And I'm sorry <laughs> that we kind of messed it up a little bit, yeah. but here's what I can do. I, <laughs> yeah. just, I love a world where you go to a restaurant and people respect yeah. PHS. Yeah. Right? Like, that's the world I want to live in. And it's called Santa Fe. Yeah, true. <laughs> so, yeah, and thank you, Amy, for, for coming to this. Um, that was who that was. But in any case, um, yeah, the post-conference retreat was really fun, and then we basically finished with two days to go before, well, so here was an interesting surprise. Mm. I woke up on Diaz announced his platform. Yay! Yeah, and cool. it, was, it was released two days before Richard and my own platform, which you're also a big part of, really our platform. Very different kind of But it's platform. not really a platform. Like, we're using Discord, and I'm building a bunch of web tools. Like, yeah. I didn't build a platform the way he did. But it, they're very different, but it's just like, we're part of the same way. Like, there were a bunch of things that were all around that time. Um, the Vladim Contemporary Art Museum oh, yeah. opened, mm -hmm. and it was a bunch of, like, new starts, right. Just, just right around that time. It was so interesting. But I hadn't realized this when we had planned... I mean, I kind of had some idea that it would be a, probably around the conference or something because, you know, Alok had mentioned that he will likely launch his platform around that time, but it was all kind of under lock and key. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then he announced it during the conference and it built a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement. And mm -hmm. I think I'm responsible for 15 people signing up or more That's because I cool. sent out a whole bunch of... Uh, I got to silver status because of that. If you send out enough invites, you get to a certain level. It's so, those achievements. Uh, exactly. So... I was really going for gold, but I think I need to get some more people to sign up mm -hmm. for that. But Plug um, it in the description. Yeah, I, I should add that to the <laughs> YouTube description here. But, um, anyway, thehdp.net. Don't sign up until you use my link. Yeah. I, I want to get that gold. Use my link. Use my link first. So I, I really want to get that gold. But um, yeah, I, I was so happy to see that come to fruition. And I just love Alok so much and the work he's done. And his talk at HDHD was so good. So is Martin Grassinger. So is Jakob. Um, so, so was, you know, uh, Meher's, uh, she did an activation that caused so much interference in the Zoom, it started to, to, wow. to, to, to kind of trip out and stuff. Wow. But, so we had four different remote guests, and each of them I just heard such glowing reviews about. Nice. People were uh, just shouting out Martin's, Martin's uh, podcast just yesterday, or his, awesome. sorry, his um, talk mm -hmm. in a podcast nice. yesterday. Fuck yeah. And then people were talking all about Jacobs and how good that was on accessing sacral response for generators and manifesting uh, generators. That sound good. Really good topic. And then Alok was just, I mean, so many, so many highlights, I don't even know where to begin, but he's one of the only human design analysts I know who isn't afraid to talk about the spirit. Yeah. And he was really saying, you know, what is this shying away from the spirit? If you're frustrated, that frustration is in your spirit. Mm, mm -hmm. Bitterness is in the spirit. Mm. Anger is in the spirit. Like mm -hmm. we need to, we need to start there. We need to heal the spirit. We need right. to, to really. They didn't say heal the spirit, but we at least need to address that. I mean, it's it's it's, it's about the G center. It's about and as someone who has an undefined G center, him, um, hmm. 
with his um, personality set in there. Mm -hmm. Or is it, oh, sorry, it's in the sacral pointing at it. But, but either way, he has an undefined G center that he has learned so much about. I mean, it's just incredible to hear his, his wisdom of a lifetime of learning about the spirit mm -hmm. and about the healthy spirit and about the spirit of the place and the right place that attracts the right spirit for you. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really so good. And I loved his answer to the question, what is the role of manifestors after 2027? Oh, did, you did, did you hear that? that? Oh, yeah, oh, that was one of the nice. audience questions. And he I said, heard other people talking about that. Well, it came up during your fifth line panel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he said, uh, easy. He's asked Ra that same question, so he can just tell you what Ra said. Oh, yeah. And then Ra said, find your pasture. Oh, yeah, really nice. And he talked about finding his pasture where he can be in peace, but then he could still engage with people and kind of said how much he loves engaging with people because he has his pasture and he has his peace, and that he doesn't like it when he gets angry with people. He doesn't want to be angry with people. Right. He's only angry with people if he's in the wrong place, mm -hmm. and if, he's being, if he doesn't have his pasture. Mm -hmm. But that from his pasture, he actually can take delight in connecting with people. And so that's how I really see his platform as a way for him to connect with people in the right format, mm -hmm. not through Facebook, where right. there's a lot of riffraff, and just, yeah, a lot of bozos on Facebook, and now he has this amazing way to connect with people, and I just love it. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy he did that. So definitely uh, excited to be a, a part of that. But then two days later, um, which was just yesterday now, mm -hmm. we launched Signpost. And that is something that I've been planning and working on for two years. I wanted Woo! to launch it. Thank you. I wanted to launch it last year at the HDHD conference, but it just wasn't ready then. And I didn't, didn't have um, all my, I mean, I, now I have this great team. It was, it's just all set up now. It's like I found my team. I'm the CEO. Richard's the COO, so he's in charge of operations. So what is Your, Signpost? Give us the pitch. Signpost is a community for human design professionals, and I also have been pitching it as the only tool for human design professionals, mm -hmm. by which I mean I'm building a bunch of web tools that are just aimed at professionals and what they might need, and a lot of ranging from the academic all the way to the business side. Mm. So for one thing, being able to make charts back to 1781 or, or earlier, but especially back to 1781, to be mm. able to do historical analysis and being able to look at things even beyond that, being able to generate PDFs that might help you for your clients and being able to have access to asset libraries. And so all of these web tools, but the thing is, just a bunch of web tools are not really going to make a community and they're not going to actually give people what they need um, if they're either a deep student of this knowledge or a professional in this. Mm -hmm. What they actually need is connection mm -hmm. with each other. And so a big part of that is being able to have online and in-person connection and the different ways of doing that such that people don't want only Zoom. Like, yeah, we have a lot of Zooms. We also have a lot of what are basically radio programs, like your program, Surfing Zeitgeist, oh. which is, right, Tuesdays mm -hmm. and Thursdays on Signpost, 10 to noon, 10 to noon Mountain Time. Mm -hmm. And Mark now has, he kind of hopped on board and he saw you were doing that and said, well, I can do noon to two. And so <laughs> he's gonna do HD satsangs, noon Sweet. to two, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Cool. And I know that Dave's gonna be jumping on and different different people, I, I will be as well. And we have, we have a lot of, we probably have about 20 plus people now who have voice access on our channel who can kind of be on air hosts. Mm. And part of that is that it's nice having Zoom, but it's also nice to be able to just turn something on like the radio and then, oh, what are they talking about? Oh, cool, they're doing yeah. George Carlin's chart. That's mm -hmm. interesting, let me listen in on that. Right. Turn it off whenever they want. There's no commitment. There's no, I mean, the Zooms have a higher commitment of, oh, I need to sign up for it, but we disappointed if I don't show, right, right. things like that. I mean, we're not really enforcing that, but just psychologically, Zoom has this baggage yeah. attached that listening to the radio doesn't really have. Right. So I would say Signpost is part Human Design Radio, mm -hmm. part Zoom, you know, educational, um, part Discord, community, mm -hmm. text chat. Then there's also going to be in-person events. I just made... Um, and all the tools. And then all the tools, and then also a content library, mm -hmm. which is, is really containing HDHD talks, containing classes. I've taught before. I mean, you know, Richard told me I was crazy to put all my classes on there for free mm -hmm. for signpost members and because... Well, then people might not take your classes or, you know, 
I'm not really worried about that because if, if they're signing up for signpost, mm -hmm. that's enough. That's mm -hmm. enough for me. Like, right. That's and and he got that too, and so he he's a totally on board with that. But it was just kind of funny because I was like, I'm gonna put all my classes on there. He's like, Wait, you're just gonna put all your classes on there, like the ones that you've taught? You're just gonna make accessible for people? Well, then why? What is their incentive for taking the yeah. class? Well, their incentive is one, they, they get it earlier. Mm -hmm. Two, they can ask me questions, be part of the Q and A. Three, they have more of a personal connection, they're supporting, and so on. But I mean, I'm just putting them on there because I want that information to get out mm -hmm. there. I'm not trying to hoard. It's like fifth line, distributor hoarding. Yeah. And pure collective being that you are. Which is also why, <laughs> yeah, which is also why I'm so excited to be launching Santa Fe Human Design Library in its next phases as well, which is not part of Signpost, but is free and, and open to everybody and so on. And then I'm also excited to be working with Ninadvistic and any other human design software developers to essentially do open source. So I, I put out HD Kit seven years ago, which mm -hmm. is a human design open source toolkit. Mm -hmm. And HD Kit is really outdated, and all it really had was a non graphical, text based way of generating charts given planetary information and so on, kind of like proof of concept. Mm -hmm. The next phase is to have body graph generators and all of the tools that people might want to build their own human design websites cool. open source. Nice. And nice. so as we build in Signpost, we'll be putting some of that in, into HD Kit as well, yeah. which, which again, you might say, well, then what's the incentive of using Signpost? Well, I'm not really worried about that because for one thing, this, the people who are members of Signpost are supporting this open source initiative. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for your support for doing that. But also you're just getting so much more. You're, you're getting such a connection to the real community of people that are in, in there. And our first cohort is set to 50 people only. It's $100 a month. So if, if we hit 50, um, we'll be making $5,000 a month, which is not a little, but it's also not a lot. I mean, I, I'm still doing other things to, to bring in income. Also because we're putting that money into paying our hosts, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of part of it, is really just as it scales, taking one step at a time, mm -hmm. scaling it up carefully, one step, one step, one step. This is the, the generator way. Maybe if I were an MG, and I know that you know Richard is an MG, so he's probably able to do a few more things at once than I am, mm -hmm. but I need to make sure each step is solid before mm -hmm. going to the next step. And so part of that is we haven't really released the web tools yet. I've been working on them. Right mm -hmm. now we have the Discord, and we have, I think we're up to 37 sessions scheduled for the month of October. Wow. So you have something pretty much every day, I mean, there's some days, like on the weekends, we don't have as much scheduled now, but you pretty much have something every day mm -hmm. that you could tune into mm -hmm. or attend, whether it's Zoom or audio. And then we're gonna have activities and watch parties for on YouTube and all sorts of stuff. So it's really a community and a way to all stay in touch the rest of the year when we're not at HDHD. Mm. So, thank you, thank you. Two years into making, really excited to see it. Amazing, come to fruition. congratulations. Thank you. So then my only other note was Neutrino Design, just my favorite oh, yeah. app. Mm -hmm. So good, and they've just released Penta, and they just keep adding yes. so many new features. I, I love that app so much, and I just highly recommend it for everyone. And if you haven't checked it out, give it a shot. It's cool. the best HD app out there. Yay. Thank you. Is that it? That's it for me. Great. Cool. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Just about an hour. Wow. Right. Lot to cover. Thanks.